morning. Good morning. If you hadn't noticed, the kiddos are going to get activity bags this morning. I'm glad some of them said hello to me. That was fun. Yeah. I missed last Sunday, and I can say and attest to the fact my wife was greeting uh, last Sunday and did the welcome, and even though she made fun of me just a little bit, which is fine. I know where she lives. Um, It's okay. But um, she absolutely told the truth. Um, You can watch online, and we're excited if you are watching online. God bless you. I'm glad you're doing it. But absolutely nothing substitutes for being at church on a Sunday morning. Would you all agree with that? I'm telling you, there ain't nothing. Because I don't know how you would have experienced everything that we experienced this morning from our children's choir to the adult choir joining us this morning and the songs. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Did we point to worshiping a God a God who is enough, a God who provides. And that's where we're going to be this morning. We are in our series uh, entitled God With Us. Um, We know what Christmas season is all about. We have been looking at different names of God that are in the Bible. Um, We could not be exhaustive because it would probably take us a couple of years to cover every single name of God that we've been able to go through. Hey, buddy. Good to see you. All right, good. Just sneak up behind me. It'd be bad, all right? But, uh, but we've, been, we've been covering these. Kyle did a fantastic job last week. Um, and if you didn't listen to that message, I would encourage you to go back online and watch it and listen to it. Man, I was encouraged at home listening to uh, the fact that, uh, that God, um, that, that, that God is, is here for us. Now this morning, um, we're going to take uh, off of the theme of the first song that the adults and the children sang together this morning, the song called Jira. How many have heard that song before this morning? You've heard Jira. Beautiful song. Um, they did a fantastic job with it this morning. Throughout the Old Testament, there are multiple names, compound names for God. Matter of fact, let me give you a little bit of a Bible teaching thing here this morning. If in your Bible you are reading throughout verses and you see the the word Lord capitalized each one of the letters, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, that is done because the translator is trying to give you the name of Jehovah God, and the only way that it could be written would to be as Lord. Well, in the Old Testament, the Jehovah idea of God, the fact that he is all-knowing, all-powerful, he is the only God, comes in compound forms. There are words that come alongside with him. Like last week, Kyle talked about Jehovah Rapha. This week, I'm going to be talking about Jehovah Jireh. Everybody say Jireh. So you can do it without gyrating, so that's good, all right? So Jehovah Jireh, in the song we repeated over and over, God, you are enough. That's part of that meaning of Jireh, that God is enough. The very basic meaning of those Hebrew words, Jehovah Jireh, is that God will provide. Everybody say, God will provide. Do it with me, you're going to help me, all right? God will provide. Say, Jireh. Jireh. That's what it means. Jehovah Jireh means that God will provide and that he is enough. God again reveals himself to us over and over throughout our lives, throughout scripture, throughout everything that we walk through. I wonder what kind of circumstances that you've gone through that you needed to know that God was enough. What kind of things are you going through right now? That it seems like God's at a distance and you really need him to provide. And the idea of Jehovah Jireh seems so far away from you. Well, hopefully this morning, as we dig into the story where Jehovah Jireh comes from, when when the words are spoken in the Hebrew scripture, what we call the Old Testament, hopefully you're going to see in my heart and my prayer is that you will find this morning that God is enough, that he is Jehovah Jireh, and that he will provide in your life. Let me pray. God, I love you this morning. I pray you use the words that I'm going to speak, God, that you've already spoken to my heart. Help me to be true to your word, true to what you have for all of us this morning. God, you are Jehovah Jireh. You are enough and you will provide. May we see this in your word today, God. If there is someone here today that needs this deep in their soul, God, may they just absolutely find that you are enough today. It's in your name we pray. Amen. 
If you've got a Bible, I would encourage you to join me and turn to the book of Genesis. This is not a hard one. If you're not a Bible person, this could be the easiest book of the Bible that you could possibly find. You just open your Bible and go to the first book. It's kind of easy, all right? We're going to be in the book of Genesis this morning, chapter 22. If you want to follow along, there'll be notes on the screen. If you, want to, if you have our church app and want to fill in blanks and do all those fun things, it's on our sermon notes. You can see everything up here, but I'd love for you to grab your smartphone, grab your Bible, and dig in this morning. Let me give you a little background on the story. Uh, the story is this. Abraham, who is the father of the Jewish nation, Abraham, at this point in time, had, he and his wife Sarah, they have been praying for years. They have been asking God for a child, and yet Sarah has laid barren for 90 years. Sarah was 90 years old when she gave birth to Isaac. Will y'all think about that for just a second? Um, at another church that I served at one time, I was a student pastor, and the pastor wanted me to go preach at a retirement home. And I had no idea how to preach to senior adults or, or how to even present myself in that room. I was used to dealing with teenagers. So dummy me went in, and the first and probably the last time that I ever preached in a nursing home, I preached on this topic, when God turns a nursing home into a maternity ward. I'm telling you, those little ladies were getting out of there in wheelchairs just as fast as they could move. Nothing to do with it. So Abraham and Sarah have spent their entire adult lives, no children, none whatsoever. But at 90 years old for Sarah and Abraham older, God sent an angel, possibly Jesus himself, came to this earth, spoke to Abraham and said, you're going to have a child. This is the child of the promise. His name is Isaac. We know if you study Jewish history or study the Old Testament or heard about it, Isaac is the son of the promise. The promise is that one day all the nations of the world will be blessed through your son, Isaac. He is a blessing given from God. And here we find Abraham and Sarah. Isaac has, has been weaned. He's starting to grow. He's becoming a young man. We're not exactly certain of his age. I know in reading the story we're going to read, some of you moms and dads are going to sit there and go, this is so horrible. How could you take a little child and do this? But understand, Isaac is somewhere between about 18 and 30 in the story that we're going to read. He's not a little kid in this moment, okay? Does that make sense? Listen, I didn't preach last week, so y'all going to be here about three hours, so go ahead and get comfortable, all right? I'm teasing. I wouldn't do that to you. We've got to beat the Methodists to the steakhouse, so we're good, all right? So here we are, Genesis chapter 22. Let me pick up the story. Abraham is following God. He's doing everything that God wants him to do, and in verse 1 of Genesis 22, here's what we find. After these things, God tested Abraham. Now, those are words that you don't want written over the banner of your life, do you? If you're familiar with the Bible, you're familiar with the story of Job. And in the story of Job, we see that the angels of God are presenting themselves before God. And in comes our adversary, Satan, the enemy. And he presents himself as well. And there's a time of testing that comes on Job. None of us wants to peel back heaven and see the words, God is testing us. It's good that we have in Scripture that we know there are times that God may do this. And we are supposed to walk through it. So let's see how Abraham walked through it. After these things, God tests at Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am, because that's what you should say if God says hey to you, all right? Here I am, he said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I shall tell you. Is there any more devastating thought than for God to say, I want you to take the thing that you call a blessing, the thing that I have blessed you with, the thing that you prayed for, the thing that you waited on, you feel like every circumstance in your life has come to this blessing, I want you to take that blessing and I want you to go sacrifice it. Now just so you feel it, what you're feeling right now is probably what Abraham felt in that moment. God said, I want you to trust me with the thing that you love the most. In some of my reading this week, I, I wrote down one commentator said this about this particular situation. He said, first of all, he had a theological crisis. God doesn't make sense in light of the word he's already given. Do you remember that I said a little bit earlier that God spoke to Abraham and Sarah and said, I am going to give you a son and he is going to be a blessing to all of the generations, to every person that ever walks on the face of the earth. 
earth. And just in case you're wondering, that's you and that's me today. That's the blessing that God says. God has spoken this blessing to Isaac or to Abraham and he said, your son will be a blessing. But now God is saying, I want you to sacrifice the blessing that I've put in your life. That doesn't make any sense. There has to be a theological idea here where Abraham says, God, you don't make sense. There was probably a family crisis because nowhere in Genesis 22 do we ever get the picture that Abraham walks into Sarah's tent and says, Sarah, I know you were 90 years old. I know we weren't capable of having children. And it's so cool that God gave us a blessing in our son Isaac. But I just want you to know, God just told me to take him up the mountain and I'm going to sacrifice him to God. Nowhere is that recorded. So I imagine in Abraham's heart and in Abraham's mind that there was a family crisis going on as well. There was probably a social crisis going on in his life. What is everybody else going to think? What's going to happen? What about all these servants and all these people that you said to follow Jehovah God? And they're going to walk with you here in a minute. And they're going to go to this mountain. And you're going to have to wonder, what are they going to think? I'm sure there was an emotional crisis. How am I going to feel? And I think this is the one that hits me and maybe hits you as well. How am I going to feel if God says, I want you to give up the thing that I've said should be a blessing in your life? It doesn't make sense and it doesn't seem fair. But here's the thing about God's names in the Bible. When God reveals his name, he's always revealing himself. That's not in your notes, but that's a good one to write down, okay? Matter of fact, if we were kind of a loud church, y'all would have said amen right there. All right, so you want me to try it again? Let me try it one more time, all right? When God takes us through difficult circumstances and God reveals his name, that's because God is revealing himself. That was cool, yeah. It doesn't count. I made you do it. All right. But anyway, just just hang in. You'll find some other moments. All right. But God does allow us to go through these difficult things. And sometimes they're painful. And sometimes they're indescribable. Sometimes they just don't make sense. And we've been through them here. And you've been through them here. And you've had them in your own life. And you've had the difficulties in your life. And sometimes, sometimes the pain is so much. But let me give you a blank to fill in and something maybe you can find in there. In the middle of every pain that you have, don't miss God because you're focused on the pain. Don't miss God. One author that I was reading this week made an incredible comment, and I'll use it multiple times this morning, but he made an incredible comment about this. He said, Abraham had to be willing to give up his blessing so that he could find the blessor in God. That was not original with me, but it sure is doggone good, wasn't it? See, sometimes God's going to take us through difficult things. Sometimes when it hurts the most, what God wants from us more than anything else is our worship. He wants us to trust him. Verse 3, so Abraham rose early in the morning. He saddled his donkey. He took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. He cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place from which which God told him. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and he saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey and I and the boy will go over there and worship and we will come back again to you. Now that doesn't make any sense to me because God had just spoken to Abraham and he said, I want you to take your blessing, I want you to take your son and I want you to sacrifice him. But I see right here in these verses here in verse 5 that Abraham when he's speaking to the young man, he doesn't say I'm not bringing Isaac back. He says, stay here with the donkey and I and the boy will go over there and worship and then we will come back again to you. Somewhere there was some faith inside of Abraham and I I have had to learn that kind of faith in my life. Sometimes God doesn't make sense and sometimes God seems extremely unfair. And in those moments that's when God says, "I want you to trust me like you've never trusted me before because I am God the provider. I am enough and I will be there for you if you will just trust me." So where does that faith come from? Well, I'm so excited that we have the entire Bible. We don't have little excerpts of it. We don't have to look at little things. If you have a Bible and want to turn over, you just want to look on the screen. Over in the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, what is known as the, uh, the, the Hall of Faith in the New Testament, the writer of Hebrews gives us a glimpse into what Abraham was thinking. And he says it this way in verse 17 of Hebrews 11. He says, by faith, Abraham, when he was tested, he offered up Isaac, he, and he who was received the promise was in fact 
uh, it was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it is said, through Isaac shall all your offspring be named. Look at verse 19. He considered that God was able to even raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. See, where did the faith come from, from Abraham? Let me give it to you in this sort of a statement, okay? We find strength in the present test that we're going through when we've seen God work in the past. You see, Abraham had already seen a 90-year-old wife, and if you know your Bible really, really well, Abraham wasn't in the baby-making business anymore either, all right? God had already seen that provision. God had already seen, or Abraham had already seen God show up in ways. And all Abraham could do was to say, I don't know how God's going to do it. I don't know what he's going to do. But God is enough. He's going to show up and he's going to provide. And I don't understand how God is going to do that. But Abraham believed that God was going to do it. Where does Abraham get the kind of faith that he says, I believe God will even raise him up from the dead? Because I, I, you can look in your Bible. If you go from Genesis chapter 1 to Genesis chapter 22, there are no resurrections recorded in the Bible. No one is raised from the dead. So why did Abraham believe that? Because Abraham believed that God was enough and that God would provide no matter what you're going through, no matter how your life is going, no matter how bad the circumstances may be, no matter how much you look into a holiday season and think, I can't walk through it. I'm alone. I don't have this. I don't have that. This is difficult, my job, my career, gas prices, whatever it may be that has you so worked up, God's enough. And he only knows that because God has showed up in the past. He's always there. Verse 6, Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and he laid it on Isaac, his son. By the way, this is one of those indications that Isaac was not a little boy. You don't lay the wood of an offering on the back of a little boy. So Abraham takes the burnt offering and he lays it on Isaac, his son. He took it, took in his hand the fire and the knife. And so they went, both of them together. And Isaac said to his father, Abraham, my father, he said, here I am, my son. He said, behold, the fire, I can see that. You're carrying the fire, pops. I see it. You got that. I know what sacrifice is. We've been worshiping my entire life. I understand what we're getting ready to do. I see the fire. You got that in your hand. And and, and we got the wood because you put that on my back and I'm carrying the wood up the mountain. But Pops, where's the lamb for the burnt offering? We didn't bring a sacrifice, Dad. How does Abraham respond? In verse 8, Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they both... So the both of them went together. I can just imagine the situation that Abraham is sitting in with his son. His son is noticing everything that's there. I see the fire. I see the wood. I see everything that we're supposed to take to sacrifice. Everything we're supposed to take to worship. But one thing doesn't make sense, Dad. We don't have a sacrifice. Abraham, in faith, is already saying, God's enough. Will you do me a favor? Will you say this with me? Say it. God is enough. Let's do it again. God is enough. I said, I don't know what you're walking through. I don't know what difficulty you have. I don't know where you're looking and saying, God, I can see you in this. God, I can see you in this. God, you showed up in this way, and God, you showed up in this way, but it sure seems like what you're asking me to go through right now is more than I can possibly walk through. I don't understand, God, the very blessing that you gave me. You're asking me to sacrifice. It doesn't make any sense. Look at this statement you'll have in your notes. When there's nowhere to turn but God, Listen, listen, listen to me. When there's nowhere to turn but God, you're right where you need to be. Right exactly where you need to be. Here's the problem. I love the book of Genesis, and I love the book of, I kind of like my whole Bible. I like every, every little book of it. I even like the maps in the back. We have the advantage of the finished book. But Abraham had to walk through the reality That I am about to sacrifice my blessing. I am about to sacrifice everything that God ever promised me. He wants me to give up. But know this, people. 
Know this this morning. Whether you're watching online or you're sitting here this morning, whether you're a Christian or not a Christian or you're here because it's Christmas and your kids sang and you're trying to figure out why am I here and something inside of you is going, wow, this seems really, really vulnerable to me and it feels like it's right where I need to be. I need you to understand something. When you got nowhere else to turn but God, you're exactly right where God wants you to be because it's where you need to be. Because you know what? That's when Jehovah Jireh shows up. Verse 9. When they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built the altar there. He laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar. Now I know we only get a picture into this in Genesis 22, but what must Isaac must be thinking when he's laying there going, Hey dad, why, why are you tying me up, dad? What, what are you doing here? God, I can just imagine Abraham going, buddy, you just got to trust me. You just got to trust me. It doesn't make any sense that the blessing's about to go. Verse 10, then Abraham reached out his hand and he took the knife to slaughter his son. By the way, the Bible's not real sanitized in case you're wondering. But the angel of the Lord, and by the way, whenever you read the angel of the Lord, especially in the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scripture, it is probably an epiphany of Jesus Christ. It means Jesus himself made an appearance in the situation. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. God is about to provide. But here's the problem I've got with this verse. Here's the problem I think that if you are a Christian, or maybe you're somebody who's not a Christian, and you, this may be your biggest problem with God and your biggest problem with church, and you understand Christmas is about gifts and about trees and, and, and about presents and about hanging out with family, but we believe Christmas is about Jesus and God with us and Emmanuel with us, but here, this might be your biggest hang up with God, and if it is, I fully understand your hang up with God. I fully understand because these words right here, they bother me in scripture. Look at verse 12 again. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to, anything to him, for now I know that you fear God. And I can imagine that if I was Abraham in that moment, I, I, and I know he didn't do this, I know what Abraham did, I've read the story, but if I were Abraham in that moment, I would have stopped and went, now you know? Seriously? Now you know? I thought, I remember in Bible school when I was a kid that, 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 that the teacher said that you're omniscient, that you know everything. God, you know everything. What do you mean now you know that I'm willing to give up? What do you mean, God, you're supposed to know? Do you mean, God, that in your sovereignty you took me through every difficult situation that I had to walk through, every idea and the thought that I was going to have to sacrifice my blessing for, before you? And, and God, you knew all that and now you're telling me now you know? That does not sound like a fair God. Can I give you just a little peek, though? Because here's where God settled in my spirit this week. You see, God knows. God knows everything. God knows yesterday, today, and forever. Nothing surprises God. God didn't wake up this morning and think, well, I wonder what is happening today. Because God don't sleep. He don't slumber. He don't, go, he don't take naps, which I like naps. But anyway, God doesn't do that. So how do we reconcile that God knows and yet he says to, says to Abraham, now I know. Let me see if I can reconcile it this way. God is sovereign. Sovereign means that God knows. God knows every single difficulty you have ever been through. God knows every difficulty you're going to walk through. Some of you, I know your stories. I've made eye contact with you this morning. I know where you are. I know where your hearts are. I know where your doubts are. I know what you're walking through. Some of you, I don't know what your stories are. But you're sitting in a place where you're saying, what do you mean God knows? And I'm trying to convince him of something. But here's the thing. God knows. But you know what God wants to do? This, this is kind of cool. This is something God taught me this week. God knows. But God wants, his, wants to experience us obeying him. That's not in your notes, but you should write it down because that's pretty good. God already knows. He knows what you're going to do. But God is also a God of experience. 
God loved this morning. And listen, there are millions of Christians all around the world worshiping this morning. But I am just naive enough to know and to believe that this morning when our children got up here and they started singing praises before God and we sang out Jehovah Jireh before God, that God went, hey, I need the rest of the world to cut off for a minute. My kids that live in water, I want to listen to them sing and worship me right now. And I believe God does that because he's sovereign, he's all-knowing, he's everywhere. He does all this. But God wants to experience our obedience. God wants to experience us saying yes to him. He wants it. He wants that worship. <laughs> Verse 13. Another one of those verses that I just see in Scripture, and God gave me a new light in this week and reading it. Verse 13, it says, And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its horns, and Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. Now, you can read that, and, and we're going to praise, and we're going to worship, and we're going to say, yes, God provided, and we see all those things in there. But me, being me, y'all, y'all, if I'm your pastor and you've known me for a little while, and I've shared a little bit about how I read Scripture, when I read that verse this week, there is one thing that occurred to me. I have never seen or heard a quiet animal when they're stuck. My daughter decided to buy a dog and bring it into our house a few months ago. My daughter calls it the zoomies. Does anybody know what the zoomies are when your dog gets the zoomies? To me, I call it psychosis. Because that dog, when she comes upstairs after not being with anybody all day because she's so people deprived, when she comes upstairs and she gets around people, there is nothing quiet about her. She runs from couch to couch. I'm surprised we have a Christmas tree still standing. She, listen, this, it's a little pit bull puppy. And, and this little dog got one of them big old fat pit bull heads. It will run slap dab square as hard as it can right into the hearth of our fireplace and go, and then turn around and look at you. I don't understand how a ram can be caught in a thicket and Abraham not notice. There may not be anything significant in that except for maybe this thought for me. That ram might have been sitting there the entire time. That ram might have been stuck the entire time in that thicket. But God didn't want Abraham to see it until the exact time that he needed to. And I don't know what you're walking through. I don't know what your difficulty is. But if you haven't seen the blessor show up yet, it's because he hadn't brought you exactly where he wants you yet. So hang on. Hang on. Go home and check the thickets. See if God don't have a ram stuck in him somewhere. And as a Tar Heel fan, this scripture is very difficult for me. which I don't know if Miss Lynn Staggs is watching this morning online. I hope she's at her church. Miss Lynn Staggs is the lady who leads the storehouse ministry in our community. And Miss Lynn, it's she and I, we love each other. We have a blast. We're so awesome. I love being able to offer up our church and do all these wonderful things. I only have one fault against Miss Lynn Staggs. She is a Duke fan. And I just found out about 15 minutes ago that Miss Lynn left me a gift right on this tree right here. When Duke comes out, all the stars fall. Amen? Isn't that right? (laughs) Miss Lynn left me a Duke ornament. So we know what we do with Dukey. So anyway, all right? We'll we'll throw that over there somewhere and it'll be fine, okay? (laughs) And whoever tinseled the tree, God bless you. All right? Sorry, I got off track. Abraham lifted up his eyes and he looked and behold, behind him was a ram caught in the thicket by his horns and Abraham went and took the ram and he offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. You see, God needed Abraham to get right to the point of obedience and obey him because here's a statement that you'll find in your notes. It's in the obedience that we find the blesser. It's in the obedience that we find the blesser. God's not going to show up until we obey. No matter what the difficulty, no matter what the thing is that we're walking through, no matter what seems unfair in your life, no matter how much it seems like, God, you made me give up my biggest blessing. God says it's not about the blessing, it's about the blessor. And if you'll trust me, I will show up at just the right time and I will do something that you cannot even imagine. So I need you to trust me. 
I had a picture in my mind this week, and we live in a whole lot different world than what Abraham lived in. And I thought about the, the drone eye view of maybe what was happening. Mount Moriah, as it's sitting there, maybe Abraham and Isaac were climbing up this side of the mountain, Isaac with wood on his back, Abraham carrying a fire. And, and maybe from a drone, maybe from a viewpoint, looking down on top of the mountain, as Abraham and Isaac were following an obedience on this side of the mountain, maybe God had a ram crawling up this side of the mountain just at the exact same time. See, here's the thing. I can't see to the other side of my mountain. But God's already got the provision before I ever need the provision. God has already showed up in the future even though we haven't arrived there yet. Genesis 22 verse 14. Abraham, in telling this story, goes on and it says, So Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide, which is where we get the name Jehovah Jireh. He will provide. He is enough. And it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. And I don't know if you're a Bible person, if you're a geography person, or, or maybe you don't understand how all this works, but this mountain of Moriah, as we are taught throughout geography and throughout Scripture, this mountain of Moriah is actually the mountain of Jerusalem. That is where Abraham went to sacrifice Isaac. And I don't know if you know this or not, but about 200 yards up toward the north side of Jerusalem sits a hill called Calvary, in case you're wondering, okay? So when God says, I'm going to provide, and forever this mount will be known as a place that God will provide, God already knew what was going to happen thousands of years later, and that he was going to provide his son, born of a virgin, at a Christmas season that we celebrate where we are today. Because ultimately, the purpose of that virgin-born child, God with us, is that he would be the Lamb of God that would take away the sins of the world. God will provide, and he's enough. Verse 15, and the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, by myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of the heaven, as the sand that is on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in your offspring, listen to this quote, in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice voice. Because Abraham obeyed God, we got Jesus. How does that pertain to my struggle, pastor? Maybe it's the same. If you obey God, you know what he's going to show up with? Jesus. Jehovah Jireh. He will provide and he is enough. As Jesus had grown up into a man, and we read in the New Testament the stories of Jesus, especially in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. There's one particular story in John chapter 8 where Jesus is uh, doing what he normally does when Pharisees and religious rulers are around, and he's debating them. Jesus is in a dispute over who he is. Now, the Pharisees and the religious rulers, they know Abraham. They know Moses, they know the law, they know the Hebrew scripture, they know what we call the Old Testament, but they will not believe that Jesus is enough, that he's the Messiah. As Jesus is debating back and forth with these men, we have recorded for us in John chapter 8 verse 54, Jesus answered them and he said, if I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my Father who glorifies me, of whom you say he is our God. But you've not known him, I know him. If I were to say that I do not know him, I would be a liar like you. But I do know him and I keep his word. Listen to where he quotes their father, our father Abraham. He says, your father Abraham rejoiced that he could see my day. He saw it and he was glad. Jesus himself telling these men that if I took you back thousands of years to Abraham with his son Isaac. Ah, Abraham was saying, God, I don't know how you're going to do it. I don't know how I'm going to make it another day. God, if I have to sacrifice this blessing, I've got to go down the mountain and I've got to go back and tell Sarah. I, I've got to live with this idea that God, you didn't show up the way I thought you were supposed to show up. God, you don't make any sense. You seem unfair. I don't know how I'm going to face life. 
But because Abraham said, God will provide, he saw the day of God and he was glad. So the Jews said to him, You're not yet 50 years old. And have you seen Abraham? (laughs) Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. I am is the very name of God that was spoken out of the burning bush to Moses. I am is Jehovah God. And I don't know what you're going through. Some of you I do. Some of you I I, I hurt for you and I walk with you. Some of you I have no idea, but I know this. He is enough. And before you ever walked into that circumstance, before that difficulty ever came your way, before you ever got the call, before you ever lost the job, before whatever the difficult situation was that's sitting in front of you, before any of that ever was thought of, Jesus was already there. And he was the I am. Let me give you a final statement. We'll never see God provide until we take the step to obey. Some of you are sitting there. Some of you have walked through some of the most difficult things that life could ever throw your way. And and I understand and my heart hurts with you and for you. Some of you have walked through things that just don't make any sense. But yet you're still sitting in that thing. You're still sitting there saying, God, you don't make sense. And maybe what God wants you to do is just say, trust me. Don't worry about the blessing. Trust the blesser. I got you. I'll provide. I'm enough. Just obey me. Just step out and obey me. I think one of the reasons we haven't experienced Jehovah Jireh is because we've never obeyed what he's asked us to do. So you can't hold on to the blessing when the blessing becomes more important than the blessor. And the blessor is enough. I I want to do something I haven't done in close to two years. And if this bothers you and you don't want to participate, that's perfectly fine. It's okay. But I could not help but sense the Holy Spirit this morning when I walked on campus. I couldn't help but sense the Holy Spirit through worship this morning. And I just feel like I would be disobedient to the Holy Spirit if I didn't do this this morning. And he's enough and I'm going to trust him. See, here's where we are. Some of you, it has been a long time since you've had to step out and step up and say, he's enough and I need him right now. So I'm going to invite you this morning. You don't have to. Please, I've said this before. It's been so long since I've said it. But there is absolutely nothing magical about the front of this building. This is not an altar. We're not sacrificing animals down here. But in a sense, you could be sacrificing yourself to God by saying, God, you're enough. God, it seems like the world and, 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 and everything feels like it just doesn't set right. God, even in my own life, you seem so unfair. But this morning, more than anything else, God, I need a reality that you are enough. So I want to invite you this morning, if you will. Everybody just stand, if you, if you can stand this morning. Everybody stand. I know the kids have been in here a long time. And kiddos, y'all have been amazing this morning, as you are every time you're in the auditorium. But I want to invite you this morning. Miss Ruth is playing for us on the keyboard. The lights are dim. I want to invite you. If you need to respond to God this morning, you need to grab somebody's hand and say, come pray with me. Take the step this morning. I know it's been two years for all of you because we haven't done it in two years. And I'm not making you. I'm just saying it's open because sometimes the reality of taking a step says, God, I need to acknowledge that you're enough. So I'm going to pray. Miss Ruth is going to play for a few minutes. There's people that are already moving. Respond to God this morning. Listen, if you've never discovered that God is enough in your life and you've never given your life to Jesus, now is the time to respond to that as well. Now is the time to say, God, you are enough and I need you in my life. No, God, you don't make sense. God, this seems unfair, but you are enough and I'm going to commit myself this morning to trust you. And if you don't know Jesus, give your life to him this morning. Let me pray. 
Miss Ruth's just going to play a couple of lines. And then we're going to close out. But I want to give you the chance to respond to him this morning. Father, I love you. God, I pray for people that have heard your word this morning. God, if I have done anything to mess up what you had planned this morning, God, just remove me from the scene. God, I pray that people respond to you. God, there are so many people that have been sitting in this place of saying, I'm not sure God's enough. And they're waiting for you to show up when what you're doing is saying, just take the step and obey me. Just make an acknowledgement that I will provide, that I am enough, that I am Jehovah Jireh. And God, when we take that step, that's when you show up in obedience. When we take the step of obedience, that's when you show up, God. So Lord, take these next few moments as you've worked this entire time this morning. Just let people unpack, unleash, lay down chains, lay down the pains and the hurts. And God, I understand we got to walk out the doors in a few minutes and life is still out there. But for just a moment, God, may we acknowledge that you are enough. God, use these next few minutes. God, you are enough, and we thank you for that. We love you this morning. You're an incredible, incredible God, and you are enough. Lord, may we find that you are enough, especially in this season of our lives, especially in this season we call Christmas. You're so much enough that you came to this earth. You took on human flesh. You became one of us, lived a sinless life, and then gave your life for us. God, you are the blessor. Help us to be willing to give up whatever we need to draw closer to you. God, if there's somebody here today that needs to give their life to you for the very first time, may they do that. Stop by the new here desk, contact me, talk to, Lord, we'll be around. Let them find you today. God, thank you. I love you. It's in your name I pray, amen.